Chairman Engel, thank you very much for your for coming and joining us today and your participation. And thanks to Eric Jacobstein, who I see in the back, who I know is one of those who helped guide you here. Uh, we're now coming to the final stage of the excellent program that NDN has put together for us today. We have two final speakers. We have Ambassador uh, Luis Gallegos of Ecuador, and we have Ambassador James Spaulding of Paraguay. Uh, Ambassador Gallegos is one of uh, Ecuador's uh, most senior and most distinguished political uh, professional diplomats. He served, has served his government ably in many capacities at the foreign ministry, including uh, many years spent working on multilateral affairs, including having been a coordinator for Ecuador's participation in the summit process, so he knows this process extremely well. He was also Ecuador's ambassador to the UN in Geneva, ambassadors, uh, Ecuador's ambassador to the UN in New York, and now currently serves uh, his, his president, Correa, as uh, ambassador of Ecuador here in Washington. It's a pleasure to have you, Ambassador. Yo tengo que principiar esto en español. Es decir, que soy, estoy muy honrado por, por estar aquí. Eh, es la segunda vez que, que estoy en este foro y obviamente me siento muy honrado por los temas que se están tratando en estos foros. Un foro importante de discusión. Uh, indudablemente, eh, tengo que principiar en español, pero me pidieron que haga la locución en inglés y en inglés es mi segundo, el segundo idioma, así que bear with me. I have a written statement which I can probably send you by email and circulate and we'll, put, we will, we'll, we'll hand it over for after, after the allocation. Um, my principal uh, emphasis on this issue is that we have a summit before us in Trinidad and Tobago and we decided that this fifth summit some years ago would, set, would, would deal with securing our citizens' future by promoting human prosperity, energy security and environment. Um, and as Mr. Cunningham just said a few minutes ago, I, I have been coordinator for, for other summits and I know how the process works. And sometimes when we were very enthused four years before, we put up a title, a, a thematic, which we think is important and over time it develops. For me, uh, this summit has turned into something completely different in the sense of what is happening in reality in the world. We are in front of one of the most grave economic and social crisis, because any economic and financial crisis has a social implication. And, we're, and we are in, in a new realm, in a new era, both in Latin America and in the United States. Uh, I would rather call it the summit of mutual respect, dialogue, and people, which is fundamentally what I would like to, the, the thematics. I'll, I have a, of course, this, this is a theme which is very suggestive, current, and linked with, to the expectation that focus on how President Obama will be seen in the first encounter with his, re, his regional counterpart. Expectations are high, considering that the change in style of governance and the tone of the new President of the United States has been acknowledged. We take into consideration the offer of a more horizontal rather than vertical relation with the hemispheric neighbors, which is ultimately what we aspire in the region. Both uh, Jeff Davidow and I mentioned to him that I was going to state, uh, I was going to mention him in my statement. Uh, he fled the floor before I said anything. And he told me, if you say that I'm guapo and uh, I'm physically able, I will, I, I will thank you. But uh, both Jeff Davidow and Tom Shannon the other day in the Inter-American Dialogue said in various, uh, that had anticipated that President Obama will focus on promoting cooperation with the rest of the continent and his position will be based on the spirit of equity, fairness, and responsibility. Jeff also noted that the new government recognizes the particularities of each country and that each has its own history and policy. I am encouraged to the point, uh, to point that this is a positive factor that beyond the Manichaean tendency in Washington to rank countries as friends or enemies. Um, and I think Congressman Engels put it very, very, very well. Each one of us has a different tendency, a different particularity, a different history, and a different culture. Latin America is diverse and complex. Though there are historic and cultural issues that are common to the region, 
There's also true that we are politically, economically, and geographically and ethnic elements that determine a very different reality in each country. Washington should recognize this reality and accordingly should establish a comprehensive dialogue with each of the governments to, of the region to determine a common agenda of interests, not only on the basis of priority designed inside the Beltway. Because of that, I consider it important and valuable that the President's willingness to listen during the Summit of the Americas and to promote an op open, honest, and equal dialogue with his peers in Latin America. A new era, a different era, is happening in, the, in, in, in Latin America. As is recognized by many think tanks in Washington, Latin America is a region that has evolved in many ways. Dictatorships of the past have been overcome. Now the region embraces democracy as a system of be uh, uh, the best system of governance, and many countries, including Ecuador, are trying to strengthen the democratic system and improve institutionalization on the basis of the em of emergence of a more just and egalitarian society. Many countries are committed to this goal. The region has experienced significant economic growth. Unfortunately, the region, as stated by Congressman Engels also, has the highest rates of poverty and inequity in the world. It is time to strengthen the capacities of the states of Latin America to promote jobs and welfare. Institutions remain weak in many countries and have not had appropriate policies to address the objectives of a plan, of, of, of a plan development projects and the millennium objectives. Quite possibly because of that, the idea to focus only on trade as a tool to promote jobs and welfare has not been totally successful in the region. And it is important to have a forum to discuss about it and to promote better cooperation to overcome poverty. I, I will be dealing with the issues of trade in another sense, because I do believe that we need to re-look re at, the, at, at, at the issue of trade as a machine of growth. While you still have the subsidies you have, the 1.2 billion or the 1.5 billion a day in agricultural products, simply trade is not a free and equal trade. Poverty and social exclusion remain an endemic problem in the region, and it is now compounded by an economic, a global economic crisis, and especially by the recession in the United States. In 2008, ECLAC Social Panorama Report acknowledges that the, region, that the region still bears the stigma of being the most unequal in the world, and the disparity in its income distribution remains high, with the average per capita income of households in the 10th decile is approximately seven times greater than that of the poorest 40% of the households. If we add to this the effect of the global crisis and the economic recession in the first trading partner of many countries in the region as of Ecuador, we have a serious problem making it essential to work together. Again, it is important to consider the ECLAC report of social situations in Latin America and in 2008 about labor situations. Aggregate employment for the region as a whole will probably be flat or even lower in 2009. As unemployment increases in the Northern Hemisphere, the migratory patterns are returning, the disemployment and unemployment in the region, in, in Latin America, will become greater. As the social situation becomes graver, violence is a tendency to, to, to see. Part of the security agenda is not only to look at the police and criminalization of the, of the issue, but also the, the root causes of what brings in unemployment, poverty, and, of course, inequity. Especially for those who are most vulnerable, gender, women and children are those that are most vulnerable, accompanied by the indigenous minorities. It is, it is a precarious situation in the region's labor markets as associated to low productivity sectors, which is largely characterized by poor job quality, a lack of job security, low wages, and lack of access to social security coverage. When the UNDP designed the global program of what development is and began to establish what the development goals were 10 years ago, it established as, as one of the goals not only social economic development but democracy as a goal. Because you can only foster in a democratic system where you have equality of opportunities, where you disengage, respect human rights, disengage the discrimination and xenophobia that normally uh, accompany these distortions of the social, in the social spheres. There are factual issues to overcome in the pattern that have been developed in Washington since 1989, particularly regarding the promotion of democracy, counter-narcotics, and trade liberalization. 
Julia Zweig of the Council of Foreign Relations mentioned that this trifecta is no longer adequate, if it ever was, to meet the region's challenges, especially those related to expanding social inclusion, alleviating poverty and inequity, and increasing public security. Julia states that Latin America in this context, U.S. policymakers have often appeared to believe that free trade alone will alleviate poverty and reduce inequity. As well, they seem to assure the region's still stratified societies poses the institutional capacity, political will, and outlines of a basic social contract necessary to endure this location of free trade and take advantages of the market open. Other factors to take into account are the domestic politics in the United States that often drive and pervert US policies toward the region. Unfortunately, this trend has been given, has given the absence of specific policies to each country and up to a certain point an ignorance of historical and civic process that some countries of Latin America have experienced. One of the issues fundamentally that you will see, and I think the, the Council of Foreign Relations has a very good booklet on this, it states that from 1995, 1945 to now, over 100 million people have left Latin America, have migrated from Latin America. Some of them to the United States, some of them to other relatives. But it states something that is unique because it has not been mentioned in the, at least my readings during these, th these last years, that this, this implies a de facto integration of people. You will find enormous groups of Ecuadorians, Peruvians, and whatever nationality who are linked to the United States by their family members working in the United States, by the trend of admiring the democracy you have in the United States, by the capabilities of working and jointly, by the remittances and the help of developing projects in Latin America and different NGOs and different institutions. But I do think that we ignore sometimes that there is a people-to-people -people link that goes way beyond what the stratified governments or governmental institutions have. And sometimes those policies ignore the importance of what is happening in the Hispanic and Latino community in the United States and the relevance an immigration law or legislation must have. Immigration for Ecuador is a principal priority. First of all, because it is a country of immigrants. From the 98 crisis in Ecuador, more than a million Ecuadorians left a country of 12 million. That has, has, has meant a dislocation of many family issues, traditional family values, it has comp complexed the situation socially, but more than that, it has provided the developed world with ever more prepared Ecuadorians to work in the economic spheres of Europe and the United States. We need a, nation, a, a federal legislation on immigration at the earliest, because what we are feeling in the United States is not only a trend to exclude Hispanics or, look, uh, or, 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 or people who look like Hispanics, I was saying that when I was educated here many years ago, it was not legal to stop an individual for what he looked like. It was not legal to stop an individual unless he had done something incorrect or illegal. Now you stop him because you stereotype him as a Latino. And, if you, and in the absence of a, of a federal legislation, counties, city, states are legislating draconian criminalization legislation that is affecting how America is looked at, but is also affecting a, a person. When you meet a person, besides the statistics, and put a face on a person who has had this problem, you recognize that it is a human problem. In my case, in November and in December, I had two Ecuadorians killed. One by a gang of young white youths. The others by a gang of black youths. This is one thing that we dislike very much in the sense that we would like to have a very forceful intervention of the American government, federal government, and Congress in applying legislation to, to solve these problems. The United States, when we talk about human integration of this type, is extremely important. If you turn on a TV in the United States, you probably have Latino programs. Well, we have all the American programs down there. Cable has meant integration. Internet has meant an enormous, comp uh, an enormous com combination of factors. It's extraordinary. My, in, in the last villages of Ecuador, because of the migratory factor, you'll find uh, hubs of, of computers being connected to all over the world. People talk, and, and, and 
This is creating an integrated world where values are also something that is important to change. And I think we are, we are advancing in our society, they're advancing more forcefully than our institutions and governments are. Counter-narcotics uh, counter -narcotics is still an important issue. But there is a need to establish a dialogue about these matters to be treated and combated. We would like the denarcotization of American foreign policy in Latin America. We recognize the problem Colombia has. I am a border country with Colombia. I, reckon I would love and aspire that my Colombian brothers reach peace in a negotiated form. I would love this to stop the, the, the narcotics flow to, to stop from the United States. But if you keep on consuming, as Secretary Hillary Clinton said yesterday, the 400 tons of cocaine you consume every year, whose value is in the 50, 60, 70 billion dollars, and if the Europeans keep on consuming 350 tons of cocaine with a value in euros almost the same, this is unstoppable. I have been dealing with the problem of refugees in the border of Ecuador with Colombia for 10 years, me. I don't think that we can solve the problem of refugees that are sick next to 250,000 in the next 10 years or in the next generation. And that is fueled by the consumption of drugs in the United States. So if we do not apply a correlation of solving the problem in the United States, this problem will not go away. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to be another Cambodia. I am a democracy and an institutionalized democracy. And that violence is not generated by me. I don't cultivate a, a gram of coca. I do not produce coca leaf in, in Ecuador. It's the only country free of coca in the Andes. But I receive the onslaught of this, and especially the humanitarian issues, which, which are extremely important to us. What I regard as the summit and the outcomes of the summit, I think that listening, if President Obama can listen, and President Obama and his team can look into what we need in Latin America, we first have to look at the problem of the crisis. Do we, ha we have a, a global crisis. How is it affecting all of us? Where did it begin? It began in the mortgage sector here. And it has compiled in a domino effect that is, that is carrying poverty to all over. How do we solve this problem? It was not induced by what's happening in that. You could be a textbook case of economics, but you, 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 you're, you're not free from losing, from losing in this casino economy that we call uh, the New York stock market. Yeah. Governments have to promote joint actions to identify economic complementarities. We are a provider of petroleum to the United States. We hope we will continue to be a provider of petroleum, but we have to look for cleaner and cleaner uh, energy sources. We have to look for better establishment of environmentally controlled areas. And here, both the senator and the congressman have spoken about the huge trucks and the, uh, the ever-increasing consumption of, uh, of energy. We have to see what the global what the global situation and the deterioration of climate is, is, is happening uh, when we meet in, in, in Copenhagen and before. Let me end by saying that my aspiration is that that summit go back to a principle that I was saying at the beginning, mutual respect, dialogue, and peace. Thank you very much.